address the speaker in spring 2020, Dr. Omar Abdelali. Uh, he is currently an assistant professor of engineering and technology, teaching in computer science and engineering and technology management department at the University of Pittsburgh, and the director of the computer engineering technology program at the University of Pittsburgh. He received uh, NS in computer science and PhD in computer science and engineering uh, from the University of Bridgeport. He is teaching undergraduate and graduate courses such as data science, introducing computing data and computer communication, and crypto uh, the currency and blockchain technology. His research interests include biometrical image and the signal processing machine learning network security and blockchain technology. But he is a member of I23 ACM ASE and the uh, today he is going to present regarding to the cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, motivation and challenge. challenge. Please join me welcome today speaker Dr. Omar uh, Absur. Hi, good evening everyone. Okay, my name is Omar Abu Dalla and I'm an assistant professor at uh, the School of Engineering here. Uh, today our uh, lecture will be about cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, motivation and challenges. Uh, let me ask you this question. How many of you heard about Bitcoin? Raise your hand. So the majority of the students heard about uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is all over the media. So anyone watch the media will hear Bitcoin maybe two or three times a day. How many of you know about what is blockchain technology is? Raise your hand. Okay. So as expected, only a few students are uh, uh, familiar with the blockchain technology. So today we will discuss both Bitcoin and blockchain technology and uh, we will explain what is blockchain technology is about and what is Bitcoin. And the uh, reason most of the students hear about Bitcoin and they don't hear about blockchain technology is because Bitcoin always on the media. However, the technology that is used to build the Bitcoin, which is blockchain technology, the okay, media does not mention that much. Okay, so we we'll start by defining what we mean by uh, blockchain. So blockchain is a constantly growing ledger that keeps a permanent record of all the transactions that have taken place in a secure, chronological, and immutable way. So let's uh, break down this definition into a small part. So blockchain is just a ledger, so it is actually just a file that is constantly growing, and this file just keeps growing and keeps track of all the transactions that happens on the network. And these transactions are permanently recorded on that file or that ledger. That means if we write something into blockchain, that will be permanently recorded and, not, and it's hard to change it. It cannot be changed. It is secure, so all the transactions that we add to the blockchain are uh, secured using advanced cryptography, as we will see in the next slides. And all the transactions that we write them, they, they, wrote, they are written in the ledger in a chronological way. Means, that means when you write a transaction, the transaction that happens, happens after the previous one. And all the transactions that we, are, we add to that uh, blockchain are immutable. What immutable means, uh, they will be permanently recorded and they cannot be changed in any way. So, the basic component of blockchain is just a block. And that block has data, and the data includes all the transactions that have been assembled inside that block or that file. And also it includes the previous hash of the previous block and includes a hash which is like a finger imprint as you can think about it, is a digital signature of that block that differentiates that block from the other blocks on the blockchain. So the basic component, which is one block that is on the blockchain, is tied to the next block using the previous hash. So the mm -hmm. uh, second block will store the previous hash of the first block 
inside it, and then we calculate the hash of the second part. And that's why we say it's what chain. So they, con uh, they make the chain that, it could, uh, that has all the blocks. The first block, of course, the previous hash of the first block is zero, because that was the genesis block and the first block that was created on the blockchain. So there is no previous hash. Then we have the third block, and the third block as well will be storing the previous hash of the previous block. So blocks are cryptographically linked together using the hash. There are a few components we need to discuss when we talk about the blockchain technology. The first component is mining, then distributed peer-to-peer -peer network, hash cryptography, consensus protocol, and immutable ledger. So all these uh, technologies or all these components, they together make the blockchain technology. The first component we want to talk about is the hash cryptography. What is the cryptography? What is that uh, algorithm that we use in order to create the hash? That's called hash uh, or SHA-256. Some of you maybe took a need for security course and maybe are familiar with what is SHA-256 is about. So SHA-256 uh, is like a digital signature of uh, document. So you provide any set of documents to the SHA-256 algorithm, and the SHA-256 algorithm will spit out uh, 64 characters of hexadecimal. And this is like a digital signature for that set of uh, data that you provided to the SHA-256, similar to our fingerprint. So that is a unique code. It's only associated with the data that, that is being given to the algorithm. And the SHA-256 is an uh, algorithm that is, was uh, designed by the National uh, 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 Security Agency. It's a public, so anyone can go through this uh, algorithm, and it has 64 hexadecimal characters. There are a few requirements for the cryptography that we need to use in the blockchain, and all these requirements satisfied by the SHA-256. So one of these, it is a one-way algorithm. That means if you... Uh, uh, you cannot reproduce or uh, re-engineer the document from the hash that was generated by the algorithm. So once you have the hash, you cannot go back and figure out what are the information or the original information. The second characteristic of this SHA-256 algorithm, it is deterministic. What we mean by deterministic, if you provide uh, a set of transactions of, or a document to this algorithm, then if you provide it again, it's going to give you exactly the same SHA. So if you keep giving the algorithm the same information, exactly the same information, or exactly the same set of transactions, then the algorithm will always produce exactly the same hash. The third characteristic is its fast computation. It's quick, very quick. So we don't have to wait for a long time to get the digital signature when we use SHA-256. And this is very important when we use it for blockchain technology. The fourth characteristic is the avalanche effect. What we mean by the avalanche effect, if you have a set of transactions and you only added one character to this transaction, then the, uh, hash that you are, the hash that you are going to get from adding only one character is totally different than the original hash that was created from the previous or the original document. So, if a hacker or uh, someone wants to change any information in the file, that hash or that signature for that file will be totally different and than, the, than the original hash. And the last characteristic of the SHA-256, it must withstand collisions. That means if an uh, intruder comes and they try to add some information to our original documents and it produces the same original hash, he can do that. So it is... Uh, um, uh, stand collagen. That's uh, another characteristic of the SHA-256. And the SHA-256 is the cryptographical uh, algorithm or the cryptographic algorithm that we use to uh, tie all these uh, blocks together uh, using uh, the blockchain. The second component is the immutable ledger. What we mean by immutable ledger? If you have 
cash and you want to buy a home, what you do, you just go and you pay the cash and you get a deed or uh, uh, you know, just a document say, this house belongs to you. You go to the government and you register this deed as a government or as a county. And most of the government in, in the world, they use a traditional letter, either you know, an electronic one or just a, a, you know, a bookkeeping. You know, they register that and they say, okay, home X belongs to Mike, for example. How difficult is for someone or a hacker to come and change that record and make the house belong to them, not to you? It's not that difficult using a traditional ledger. However, using a blockchain, we can record that you purchased the house in one of these blocks, and the block, as we said, has a list of transactions. One of these transactions can be the purchase of the home that you just paid the money for, and now, if an intruder try to come and tamper this information and change the ownership of this home, what happens? This block will become invalid. Why? Because once that information is changed, the hash that we created for that, or the digital signature that we created for that block, will be totally different. And once this block is becoming invalid, all the other blocks that after that block will be invalid as well. Why? Because all of them, they store the previous hash of the previous block, and the previous hash will be different. So all of these will be invalid. So it is hard for an intruder to come and change the information if we use a ledger or blockchain to record the ownership of our real estate uh, transactions. Another component of the uh, distributed, or another component of the blockchain technology is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. But blockchain technology is not residing on one computer. It is residing on a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. So we have thousands or hundreds of thousands of nodes or computers. They keep the blockchain ledger. They keep a copy of the blockchain ledger in each one of these nodes. So as you can see here, each one of these nodes has a copy of the blockchain. And if a new block is added, a new set of transactions added in one uh, computer, that will be replicated on all other computers. And same thing, the ledger will be grow in all the nodes at the same time. And when we talk about blockchain, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of nodes that participate in the blockchain technology. So if an intruder come and tamper one of the blocks in one of the nodes and change the information on this block, what happened is, all the adjacent nodes to this, not, to this computer will uh, uh, agree that the copy of blockchain is different than that they, what they have. And they reach to a determination or they reach to uh, a consensus uh, together that this blockchain is abused and they will force this node to change that blockchain to the copy that they have. And this way, together, they maintain a valid ledger or a valid blockchain at all the nodes. As you can see, they force this node to change it and they all become uh, having the same uh, blockchain or the same ledger. The fourth component we want to talk about is mining. How many of you heard about Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining? Raise your hand. One, two, you are in my class, so you shouldn't hear about it. Okay, so. Mining is, right now we have a digital currency called Bitcoin, and in order for us to add a block to the blockchain, miners has to verify all the transactions inside this block, and add this block to the blockchain. So this is the process of mining. So let's dig deeply in the process of mining. A block, as you know, it contains the uh, block number, and it contains data, it contains the previous hash, and it contains a hash for the block itself. So this is the component of the block. In addition to that, we have a field in the block called nonce, okay? So what the miner do is, the miner will take all the information in the green box here, so the block number, the nonce, the transactions, or the data, and the previous hash, and will give this information to the SHA-256 algorithm and they will generate a hash which is a digital signature for the block as you can see here. So the minor job is to create a hash that is below the target that the protocol or the blockchain protocol has set. So the blockchain protocol will have a target as you can see here and that target says 
If anyone can find the hash for that block that below this target, then that miner will win the competition and he can add this block to the blockchain and he gets all the rewards that comes with that block. So the protocols, okay, it's very important to understand that this is a distributed and uh, protocol. So there is no central agency controlling the activity that goes into the blockchain technology. It's a distributed uh, algorithm. So here we have uh, the, the target. So if we uh, imagine that this is the pool that has all the possible hashes that can be generated, because as we know, the hash is only 64 characters, that means it is a number. So we have a set, we have a limit of these numbers, right? It's a huge limit, but it's a, there's a limit. So on the top here is the largest uh, hash. On the uh, bottom here of this pool is the smallest hash, possible hash that we can generate. And here is the target, and if this hash, this hash belongs here, and this hash belongs below the target, then this one, or the miner that found this hash, will win the competition, and this, they will uh, be rewarded for that. So let's take an example here. So here we have a block, and the miners now want to start mining this block and find the hash. So what they do, they start changing this field, which is the nonce. They cannot change the transactions information. They cannot change the block number. The only they cannot change the previous hash field. The only things they can change is the nonce number here. So they keep changing the nonce. Every time they change the nonce, they calculate the hash. And the hash here, they test. Does the hash below the target? No. They try again. So they what they do? They change the nonce to another one. In this case, it's five thousand twelve, <coughs> and they generate a hash. Now they test. Does this hash? Uh, reside below the target, the answer is yes. If the answer is yes, then they win, and they, uh, they uh, we say that miner successfully mined the block, and they will be able to add this block to the blockchain, and in reward, they get Bitcoin, or they get, you know, some sort of reward in order for them, because they invest a lot of uh, electricity, they invest a lot of effort in order to mine the block, so they get reward in terms of uh, that. So that is the mining that happens on the blockchain. The last component we have on the blockchain is the consensus protocol. As we said, the blockchain is distributed between hundreds of thousands of nodes. So all these nodes has to come to consensus when we have uh, anything happening in this ledger. So that consensus protocol has two uh, challenges, or we solve two challenges. One is called the attacker's challenge, and the second called the competing chains challenge. So what is the attacker's challenge? We have the ledger distributed to all the computers, okay? The attacker's challenge means someone come and add a malicious block, okay, uh, to the uh, blockchain. So if a hacker comes and adds invalid block to the blockchain, how we are going to prevent that using a consensus protocol? The second challenge that a consensus protocol of blockchain will solve is the competing chance. What we mean by the competing chance, what if two miners, okay, one here in America, one in China, mine the block at the same time, means they found the hash at the same time, and both of them added this block to the blockchain. So now the question is, which one we are going to uh, continue with, the orange one or the purple one? We need to understand in the blockchain, we have only one blockchain. We cannot have two different, two, two ledgers. It has to be only one. So if two miners mine a block at the same time, then we have two different chains here, and we cannot allow that. So the consensus protocol solves this problem as well. So uh, the consensus protocol that we use in uh, uh, Bitcoin blockchain is called, on, on most of blockchains, we have two major consensus protocols, one called the proof of work, the other one called a proof of stack. So proof of work is the one that uh, we uh, use in Bitcoin and the one that we will discuss here. A proof of stack is another type of uh, protocol that is used with other type of digital currency, but we will only discuss in this lecture the proof of work. So the proof of work is called the proof of work because the miners do some kind of work in order for them to find the hash and uh, mine the block. So once they find the hash, 
they are proving that they did some work in order to find the cash. So that's why the name of proof of work comes in picture. So now, how the proof of work uh, will solve the problem of adding a malicious plot at the end of the chain? Let's say we have an attacker here and he wants to add a malicious plot. That attacker, uh, uh, there are two reasons for that attacker to not do that. The, the number one reason is uh, when, when we add a new plot here, the miners get uh, a reward and because they did, as I said, they did work and if that plot is a malicious plot, then that, that plot will be rejected by the network and that miner will not get any reward. So there is a reason for them to play fair here. The second reason is that that miners as well will, go, will get also not only the reward for finding the plot, but also will put all the fees that is associated inside that transaction. Because we said the plot has a transaction, and every transaction having inside the plot has a small fee. So all these fees, the one who is going to get it is the miners who mine the plot. So if he if the if that plot is malicious plot, then he is not going to get any one of these fees. The third reason why. Uh, 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 the network or the consensus protocol will prevent adding a malicious plot to that blockchain is because uh, all these nodes, when it add, when they add this, when they add the new plot to their uh, blockchain, they have to go through a set of rules and procedures and check. They have to check if that plot is valid or not, and if that is not valid, it's going to be rejected. The second challenge that the consensus protocol will solve is the, comp the competing chains. And as I said, we have two miners, one mine the orange plot, one mine the uh, purple plot. And the way that the consensus protocol will solve this, the longer chain is the one is going to win. So how, what I mean by the longer chain is uh, once the orange block is, is mined, then it starts to propagate through the network. And same thing, the purple one starts to propagate through the network. Uh, depending on the throughput of the network and the speed of the internet of that part of the world, maybe the orange plot will propagate faster than the purple plot and the orange plot uh, chain that maybe become longer than the purple plot. If the whichever is longer, we will make it a winner and the other plot, the purple plot will be removed from that side of the ledger and it will really call it an orphan plot and is not valid anymore and the orange one will be added to all the uh, blockchains uh, and all the nodes in the uh, distributed network. And in this case, uh, the miner who mined the orange block, he is the one who is going to get the reward. The miner who mined the purple block will not get anything. And then the, the ledger will be valid in all the computers. And we have only one ledger. So now, from this quick presentation about the blockchain, we can identify uh, some motivations and benefits of using technology. The number one is the transparency and the trust. As I explained to you, when we add uh, transactions to the blockchain, all these transactions are uh, available for us to see. So there is a website called blockchain.com. If you look, go there, you can pick any plot from the blockchain open it and you can see all the transactions inside this plot. So it's totally transparent. And because it is transparent, people will trust these transactions because everyone can check and double check these transactions. Uh, as we can see now, the, um, the agency, they collect donations. They start thinking of creating applications based on the blockchain because it is transparent and the trust. The second advantage of using the blockchain is the immutability. Immutability, as we uh, describe, any transaction that is written inside the blockchain is totally uh, is permanent, is totally immutable. So no one can change any transaction, and that is advantage of blockchain. So if your application, for example, require changing the information that you write into the uh, file, then blockchain is not the right application. The database will be the right application because database, we can update information in the database. Blockchain, we cannot update information in blockchain. It's totally immutable, immutable application. Uh, the third advantage of using the blockchain is uh, high availability. Because we are running that blockchain on a thousands of nodes and in a distributed network, then that 
uh, ledger or that function is available 24 7 it's always available other you know if uh, any times you want to uh, do a transaction with blockchain it will be available for you uh, simplification of current paradigms is another advantage of using blockchain technology right now if we take a look at the system or the model of the insurance companies and healthcare or finance we will find that they are quite disorganized why because each entities in this or in this uh, era they need to keep their own database right and they need to maintain their database and if they want to share information sharing the information is quite complex between these entities however if all these entities using a shared ledger like a blockchain then sharing the information and the trusting each other will become much simpler and uh, maintaining that model or that system is easier because we don't have all these distributed systems. Fifth is faster dealing. An example of faster dealing is Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the first application that is built on the top of blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is not a new technology. It's been there since 1990. So the first paper that was written in blockchain was in 1990. But however, no one built any application on blockchain since then. The only one application that is built on blockchain is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is a digital currency. We'll talk about it after this slide. However, that allows for faster dealing. So when you do a transaction on blockchain, your transaction will be confirmed in less than 10 minutes. However, if you go to the bank and you do a wire transfer, your wire transfer will take at least, if you are lucky, three days. So that is the faster dealing that blockchain will bring in the table. Cost saving, since the blockchain eliminates the middleman in between, so now we don't have to have a third party between two, uh, the, the two individuals to do a transaction. So since we are eliminating that middleman, then now we are saving the, for the saving cost because all the fees that goes into to that middleman has been saved. Highly secure <coughs> because we are using the cryptographical uh, uh, cryptography to uh, make sure we have a digital signature. Okay, for all these transactions, the transactions that we write into the blockchain is totally secure. And the last thing is decentralization, which is the fundamental idea of the blockchain technology. All the uh, information or all the ledger that we have is distributed between thousands of nodes. So it is available and it is decentralized. So there is no central organization uh, manipulating okay, the use of the uh, technology. So uh, next we want to discuss uh, the uh, cryptocurrency. And one of the most in, uh, famous examples and most important examples of cryptocurrencies that exist right now, there are right now more than 2,000 cryptocurrency. But Bitcoin is the most important one between these cryptocurrency. When I say cryptocurrency, it's a form of electronic cash. So we are used to the fiat currency like dollar or euro uh, or yen or ruby or whatever. However, the digital currency is totally different. You can send that money <coughs> from point A to point B, okay, without uh, having to upgrade from the double spending problem. Double spending problem with digital uh, currency is uh, a major problem. For example, if you have a photo, okay, and you want to send this photo, I have a photo, I want to send it by email to uh, him. So I can just copy that photo and send it to email. Then I can copy the same photo and send it to him. And copy the same photo and send it to him. Same thing happening with the digital money. If I have a digital money, I might spend it and send it to him and pay him and pay him and do the double spending. Double spending is a major issue when we use digital currency. However, Bitcoin solves this problem. So let's define Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, is a form of electronic cash. It is a decentralized digital currency that is built on the top of the blockchain technology. Bitcoin will allow you to send money from point A to point B without using the middleman, without using a, a, a third party or a bank. And that's where the revolutionary uh, comes uh, about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is built based on three uh, hierarchy. The first hierarchy is uh, technology. 
which is blockchain. So Bitcoin is on the top of the blockchain technology. The second hierarchy is protocol or coin. So on the top of blockchain, we have different protocols. Bitcoin is one of them. So Bitcoin is not only a digital currency. Bitcoin is a protocol. What is a protocol? A protocol is a set of a procedures and rules that the entity participate in this network, they agree on in order to deal with each other. So Bitcoin provides this okay, medium for all the participants of the network to deal fairly with each other. So there are other protocols that are uh, uh, developed based on the blockchain technology. For example, we have Ethereum, we have Waves, we have Neo, we have Ripple, and there are many more. Each one of these protocols have their own digital currency. So for example, Bitcoin have its own digital currency which is we know Bitcoin. Ethereum has its own digital currency which is called Ether and so on, so on. So all of these you see here are protocols and at the same time they have their <coughs> coins associated with this protocol in order to facilitate the transaction in, inside this protocol. So if you are Using Bitcoin protocol to send money from point A to point B, you have to pay a small amount of fees. These fees will be paid using a digital currency called Bitcoin, and so on. So on top of that protocol, we have token. So tokens are uh, built using the smart contract uh, that is available on the protocol. So Ethereum protocol, they provide uh, a... Uh, uh, provide a development tool called smart contract the smart contract can be used to to uh, create tokens so all these tokens are created in the top of ethereum bitcoin however does not provide smart contract and that's why there is not no tokens uh, has been built on the bitcoin protocol there are other uh, tokens built on waves and neo and other level for example has no tokens so what we need to understand from this slide is Blockchain is the main technology, uh, Bitcoin is a protocol and a coin at the same time, and there are other cryptocurrency, they are not a protocol, however, these are, co these are tokens built on top of the protocol. So all of these you see here, in layer 2 and layer 3, uh, these are digital currency, they are right now have value, and you know people are trading them and using them to pay for transactions. So who invented Bitcoin? The inventor of Bitcoin called Satoshi Nakamoto. Satoshi Nakamoto is uh, someone hidden. We don't know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. he a person? Is he a group of people? Is he an organization uh, or agency or government? We don't know. However, Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a, a white paper in 2008, in October 2008, and published this white paper. And that why that white paper explained in detail what is the Bitcoin protocol about? And in his paper, he explained how he can solve the double spending issue. So if you have a digital money, you can send it to me, and we can trust each other, even though we don't know each other. So in his protocol, he solved this, and this is the major problem, and he solved that. His white paper is available on the internet, so if you type, uh, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, you can read it, it's only 8 pages, and it's uh, very well written. So Satoshi Nakamoto, after he published this white paper, he uh, mined the first block. The first block was mined in 2009, in January 2009. So we call it the Genesis block. Right now we have close to 0.6 million blocks in the blockchain technology. The first block was mined in uh, 2009, January 2009, by him. So, so why Bitcoin have this popularity? Why everybody is talking about Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin was the first application to bring the blockchain technology from theory to uh, application or to use uh, application. And of course, uh, millions of people can now interact with each other and can send money to each other and they trust each other even though they don't know each other. So when we talk about the Bitcoin ecosystem, we talk about nodes, which is me, you, and anyone who uses Bitcoin and wants to send money using Bitcoin. Uh, we talk about miners. Miners are the people who uh, uh, keep a copy of the ledger and the people who mine it 
a transactions and add a new block to the blockchain. We talk about here in the, in the Bitcoin ecosystem about large mines. Large miners are a large scale of miners. Okay, right now we have large miners in China, for example, because the liquidity uh, is very cheap over there. So they build a huge okay uh, facility like data center of mining Bitcoin. So they have these. Uh, devices, we call them ASIC to mine a Bitcoin, and all these devices, they have like uh, thousands of these devices, which lay down, okay, parallel to each other, and they use it as a large, you know, miner. So that's the fourth ecosystem in Bitcoin is the mining boot. What we mean by mining boot? Instead of individual miner mining by themselves, because it's not worth it anymore, they, individual miners, uh, they get together and they form a pool of uh, miners, so mining pool, and there are set of rules and procedures when someone mines Bitcoin, how that will be distributed between all the people who participate in this pool. So in Bitcoin, we have a monetary policy, like any currency, like the Federal, uh, the, uh, Federal Reserve here in the United States, they have their own, okay, they have their own uh, monetary policy. Uh, to make sure all the finance, all the banks, they uh, follow this monetary policy. Same thing with Bitcoin. We have two major monetary policy in Bitcoin. One called the halving, the other one called the block frequency. So what we mean by the halving? As I said, every time the miners mine a block, they get reward. How much they get? At the beginning, in 2009, when the first block was mined, they used to get 50 Bitcoin. When they, when they mine a block, they get 50 Bitcoin. And by the way, right now in the blockchain technology, we mine block every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, a new block is added to the blockchain. So in 2009, the reward was 50 Bitcoin. Four years from 2009, or after 210,000 blocks, that reward is half to the, it's divided by two. That's what we mean by halving. So instead of 50, they are bid 25 when they mine a block. And after uh, 210,000 blocks, they are bid 12.5 Bitcoin as a reward when they mine a block. Nowadays, okay, I checked the uh, blockchain uh, website, and uh, in February 4, we have block number 615,000, uh, and the reward is still 12.5. Approximately, I did the math, every 10 minutes we have a new block, so approximately in May 220, uh, around May 10th, uh, we will reduce that uh, reward from 12.5 to 6.25. And that monetary policy will continue. And uh, uh, we will, every 210,000 uh, block, we will reduce it by half and it will continue that way. Another reason why Bitcoin is so popular because we have a, a limited number of supply of Bitcoin. So the only uh, number of Bitcoin that will be available, only 21 million Bitcoin. So when Satoshi Nakamoto wrote his paper, he specified that only 21 million Bitcoin is available. So right now in the market, we have 18, around 18 million Bitcoin has been released. How the Bitcoin is released? Whenever a miner is mine a plot, they get a reward, and we take from the, this, the one that is not released, and we add it to the market. So, looking at this slide here, that slide shows us that uh, how the halving is going. So that the, uh, the uh, blue line here means when we started the Bitcoin network, the, the reward was 50, as you can see here, 50 Bitcoin per block. Then, after we reached 210,000 plus, the reward became 25 plus, as you can see, and so on, so on. So the reward will be going down, 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 down. And the, the available Bitcoins in the red line here, when we started Bitcoin was zero. After a few years, or after we mined 210,000 plus, now we have 10 million, now we have 18 million, so we are somewhere here at 10 million. At the end, all the Bitcoin will be released by the year of 240. So by the year 2140, all the 21 million Bitcoin will be really released based on Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, and there will be no more Bitcoin released into the system. So uh, this is one uh, this is one of the things that why people believe in Bitcoin because they say 
Bitcoin is a deflationary digital currency, not like dollar, because in, you know, in fiat currency, when the federal uh, want money, they just go and print dollars from nowhere. They, they have nothing backing the dollars or something like that. However, in Bitcoin, Bitcoin is considered a deflationary currency. So as you can see, more Bitcoin will be supplied until 221 million. However, the uh, inflation in the orange line here is going down. So Bitcoin is considered a deflationary currency, and that's mean that you know when you have when you put more money into the market, you create an inflation, right? However, that's not the case with the Bitcoin. All right. So the next topic we're going to discuss is the block frequency. As I said, in Bitcoin, we use a block every ten minutes. However, Bitcoin is not the only cryptocurrency that is available right now and built in top of blockchain. We have another cryptocurrency like Ethereum is so popular. Why? Because Ethereum allows us to create a smart contract on the top of the protocol. And the smart contracts are endless. Right now, people are uh, selling their real estate uh, building based on smart contracts. So there is a developer in New York City. He built a... Uh, you know, a tower, and he needs money. However, there are no banks is giving him any loan. So what he did, he created a smart contract, and he makes the building into small chunks. So anyone can own like a few square feet of his building using the smart contract, and people from around the world can now invest in that building and using a smart contract. Other people building a smart contract to facilitate the process of selling their products. For example, artists. And instead of uh, having a middleman charging them money in order for them to sell their art, they create a smart contract, and if you are interested in their art, based on that smart contract, you can buy their product. So you don't need an attorney, you don't need an, a middleman in between, and so on, so on, so on. So the smart contracts open an endless area of innovation, which is make, why making the Ethereum as popular as Bitcoin. Uh, Ethereum blocks are generated every 15 seconds. So every 15 seconds, we do have a new block released into the blockchain. Ripple every 3.5 seconds, Litecoin every 2.5 seconds, Bitcoin every 10 minutes, and so on. So there are different, you know, times how many blocks, how uh, how often the blocks will be released in the blockchain based on this cryptocurrency. So now we come up to the uh, challenges that is uh, available or the challenges that this technology faces. This technology is still immature, so still in the process of development. And there are many challenges. The most important challenge that we are dealing with is scalability. So uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned that in my talk, but the size of the plot in the Bitcoin network is only one megabyte. So only one megabyte of data can we can fit into that plot. So if we have more adapt, more people using the Bitcoin and more transactions is happening, then that one megabyte is not enough. So there is a there is now research how we can scale the size of the blockchain without doing hard fork, without you know because sometimes if you do uh, uh, practical you know things that you have to do a hard fork. Uh, Another example of scalability right now, the number of transactions on the Bitcoin is only seven transactions per second. If we compare that to the Visa, the Visa has 200 uh, or 24,000 24, transactions per second. So 24,000 transactions per second compared to seven transactions per second is nothing. So as we can see here, the Bitcoin that based on the blockchain has way to go okay, in advancement in scalability in order to reach mass adoption. Second challenge is, is adaptability. So the technology needs to be adapted or it needs to adapt to new changes. An example of that, as I said, when we increase the size of the flock, now how the technology will be adapted to that challenge? When we increase the number of transactions, how the, the technology will adapt to these challenges? So the adaptability is another uh, issue. That's why the improvement right now in the blockchain and Bitcoin network, it's going on. There are some improvements, however, the improvements are slow. Regulation. Regulation is one of the most uh, important challenge that is faced right now. None of the governments right now uh, consider the uh, cryptocurrencies as a legitimate currency. So none of the government agencies will accept 
your uh, digital currency money uh, as a payment. However, there are many other private uh, agencies that do accept uh, you know, digital currency. For example, if you go to Craigslist, all of us know Craigslist. We sell you know, our stuff on Craigslist. You can go to Craigslist and buy your car using Bitcoin. You can go to gold and silver and buy gold and silver using Bitcoin and so on. So there are many other you know, uh, organizations that accept digital currency. However, government, they don't. So there are many regulations need to be set up okay, in order to make uh, this technology available everywhere and make this technology also trusted by many other parties. So regulations is something is still uh, an infant and it has to uh, wait. Uh, a, lot, a lot of things have to be done in order to improve that sector. Energy consumption. As I said, when we have uh, when we have a blockchain, the, each block is added to the blockchain is added by a miner. The miners will do a lot of computations in order to find the hash for that block, and that requires a lot of electricity consumption. So there are a lot of Google people saying, okay, blockchain is a great technology. However, the energy that the blockchain is consuming is not justifying, okay, for the usage of blockchain. So this is another challenge. Right now, the total energy that's consumed by the uh, Bitcoin blockchain is equal to a country of size, cheap republic of 10 million people. So you, you imagine the size of electricity that is used to, you know, for the hash power for this technology. So there, the solution for the energy consumption is, instead of using the consensus protocol proof of war, which the miners have to prove they have done the work, there is another protocol I mentioned, which is the proof of stake. And Ethereum, for example, is uh, going toward the uh, proof of stake. So uh, this is something we need to be considered. Privacy. As I said, all the transactions that is written into the blockchain are available for us. Okay, they are not hidden. Transparency is one of the one of the uh, uh, benefits of, of the blockchain, and that's why we have a trust in this blockchain. So, how this is going to work with the privacy? If you put my information as a as a patient into the blockchain, and everyone can see this information, then my privacy is. Uh, not intact. So uh, there are a lot of research going on on how to uh, use blockchain in such sectors and at the same time uh, keep the privacy intact. Ledger size. Right now I told you that we have six, uh, close to 0.6 million uh, uh, blocks in the blockchain. So these uh, 0.6 million, 610,000 uh, blocks, the size of these right now is 250 gigabytes. And still, Bitcoin did not, did not reach mass adoption. When Bitcoin reached mass adoption, like in the year 225, that size will be hundreds of terabytes, the size of the ledger. And that is not acceptable for someone mining Bitcoin to download that, that huge size of ledger. So there's a lot, a lot of research going on now on how to uh, change the information that we store in the blockchain or how the miners will be uh, downloading the ledger, not the whole ledger, maybe downloading only few information from the ledger. So this is another challenge that's still uh, in, uh, in the world. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we have maybe 10 minutes that's for a question and answer. Yes, sir. If you have any question, raise your hand and go ahead. Yes. How is the value of like one Bitcoin converted to like a traditional currency? Good. So uh, how we uh, first of all how we buy Bitcoin? How we translate that digital currency to a, a regular currency? So there are exchanges available. Okay, these exchanges are, uh, uh, for example, in the United States, the the, the most uh, advanced or the popular exchange called Coinbase. Okay, this is an exchange. You go to this exchange, you sign in, and you uh, provide them with uh, information. They ask you for all kinds of information. Then they will give you a digital wallet, okay? That digital wallet, you can buy digital currency and save it into this digital wallet. Now, if you don't want this currency in digital currency, you want to convert them back to fiat currency, 
you can just switch to di to fiat currency. So you can either have a digital currency or fiat currency. So if you have a, a Bitcoin using an exchange, you can change it to dollars and deposit to your bank. So you 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 will link your bank account to these exchanges. And right now, since we talk about exchanges, right now all the exchanges are centralized. That means if the government wants to shut down, you know these. Uh, exchanges it will be easy but now there is a research going on to make even the exchanges decentralized just like the Bitcoin so if we make the exchanges decentralized it will be hard to manipulate or shut down these exchanges yes uh, well the, how, how do you know the value of the Bitcoin to the currency like is there any standard with yeah exactly that's a good question so how you value gold how you value dollar, how you value euro, it's based on, uh, on people who trust this, you know, uh, whatever you call it, uh, you trust this money. So based on the demand, uh, the supply and the demand, the value of Bitcoin. So when there is more interest, when, when, when there is more people who are using Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin will go up. When you trust it, when you use it, the value of Bitcoin goes up. So nothing is backing Bitcoin other than the people who use Bitcoin. It's available on CoinMarketCap. Yes, yes. Uh, the coin, there is a website called, called CoinMarketCap.com. If you go to this website, you see the list of all the uh, digital currency that is available. As I said, we have close to 2,000 uh, digital currency. One of them is Bitcoin. Also on this website, you can see the value of each one of these uh, uh, digital currency. And that's bring me to a funny story. When Bitcoin was invented in the year of 2009, the value of Bitcoin was close to not even one cent. Okay? And at that time, a guy, he uh, uh, mined Bitcoin and he uh, bought Bitcoin in, uh, he bought 10,000 of Bitcoin. So the 10,000 of Bitcoin, it was like only maybe uh, $20. So he went and he bought pizza with that. And we call that moment a pizza moment. Right now, Bitcoin is like $10,000. If he kept that, he would have been a multimillionaire. So there's a, the value of Bitcoin is actually fluctuating a lot. So like in 2017, in December 2017, one Bitcoin was like $20,000. Uh, three months ago, Bitcoin was only $3,000. Now Bitcoin is around $10,000. So the price of Bitcoin is extremely fluctuating. And that, this is one of the reasons why it's not have uh, reached to many uh, companies because they said, okay, I'll sell my product using Bitcoin and tomorrow the Bitcoin is like half of the price, so it doesn't work. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, I wanted to know that how can you tell um, malicious uh, block uh, from a legitimate block? Okay, as I said, uh, there are, uh, we have, we have the blockchain. There are many ways of telling that. So depending on what malicious block you, you are talking about, if an intruder tries to come and change the information of a block, we right now away we know that is invalid because the hash of this block will be changed, right? Mm -hmm. So that is solved. If your question is, what if someone adds a malicious block at the end of the chain? Mm -hmm. How we identify that this block is malicious? As I said. There are two reasons why he will not do that, because in order for him to add this malicious block, he has to go through a lot of work and he has to spend a lot of money. Keep this in aside. The other reason, which is the important reason, when other nodes, we have tens of thousands of nodes participate on the ledger, right? When they take this malicious block and they try to add it to their chain, they have to go through uh, like a lot of uh, check, a lot of rules. They have to check if this. I, I cannot name them for you right now, but in the algorithm is listed. Like uh, hundreds of things they have to check. The time stamp of that uh, block, and uh, they have to check the previous task, they have to check the validity of the transaction, the source of the transaction, and so on. So they will find out this block is not legitimate. Because uh, uh, blockchain is, um, we know exactly what transaction is going on, and we can verify if this transaction is coming from the pool or not coming from the pool. So there is a way to find that. Yes. So how do you create a legend? There is a pool. Okay, let's say uh, all of us now, we use Bitcoin. Okay, I send you money, you send me money. All the transactions that we do will go 
into a pool. We call it a pool transaction. So let's say in this pool we have like right now 1,000 transactions. Okay, none of these transactions has been confirmed because none of these has been added to the blockchain. So miners, their job is to uh, pick a certain number of, based on specific rule, pick a certain number of these transactions, add it to the to the to a block, and then mine the block. Once they find once they find the hash or the digital signature for this block, then these transactions will be moved, and this block will be moved to the blockchain. And once this block is moved to the blockchain, now these transactions are confirmed and valid. Yeah. Yeah, we'll open up questions for another one, yeah. Um so um Bitcoin is like definitely the most famous uh, technology that's coming from blockchain. But there are so many industries that can benefit from it. I I read a little bit application of the energy industry, um in renewable energy, but what is the industry that you think that can benefit the most from blockchain technology outside of banking and cryptocurrency? Actually, the only, I think the, the banking or the finance sector is the one that is going to be, however, they deny it yet. They are not mm -hmm. seeing it as a potential, but that will be a huge benefit. Another, another uh, application that is used on, uh, that used the blockchain technology is supply chain management. So as you maybe heard on the news, Walmart is uh, using blockchain <coughs> technology to be, so as you are a customer, when you buy a product, we know exactly where this the origin of this product is coming from, and it is trusted because it's in the blockchain. So another sector is real estate, another sector is uh, health, the health sector and the uh, insurance sector. When we have a claim, and we to verify if the claim is authentic or not authentic, if everything is in the blockchain, then that is easy. Education, for example. You, when you want to do your transcript, what you have to do? You have to contact the registrar. The registrar has to mail it to you, certified and stamped, right? What if we have a blockchain that the educate the all the universities can trust this application and when you want your transcript, you just call your cell phone and show to third party this is my transcript and because in the blockchain it's one hundred percent verified. So I think all the sectors will benefit from blockchain, not only one sector. Uh, but since blockchain the since the first application was successful in blockchain is a cryptocurrency, I think it has been proven that the finance sector can also benefit from that as well. Okay. Yeah. Last uh, core for any question? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. You've just told that supply chain management is a place where... Yes, it's another application. Blockchain. But uh, supply chain management, I mean, like it has a lot of data to be processed. Like, much you told me the scalability of the blockchain is not so much because you have multiple networks. How will we cope up with so much information? I'm like... Okay, um, depending on what supply chain management we are talking about, there um, are many of applications of supply chain management. So, for example, in order to track okay, a product from its origin mm -hmm. to its consumer, that has been uh, uh, in the way of implementation by Walmart, because the only things you need to record is every hub when this product is moving in. Okay? So this kind of application can be done. Other applications that require a huge number of information as I said, we have a limited size of a block, which is one megabyte. So that needs to, you know, be thinking about. So it's not. So okay, maybe I mean, like, how do As you? As I said, this them? technology is still in the uh, uh, infant uh, stage, and uh, it's still many years to come in order to to reach uh, mutual uh, in order to mature. So we still have room to improve, and everything that started small then improve. I will remind you with that. TCBIB protocol, which is was the invention of the internet. At that time, if we think that billions of people who's gonna use the internet, so at that time we think, okay, how is the IBS is going to be enough? However, you know, solutions come on the way, like IB version six has been introduced, and other solutions as well. Okay, so if you have more question, you can come to the front and he. Yes, we he, can he have can a say here. On the side. Thanks so much. One more big applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.